We started on a journey last week, and uh, the title of the message um, is Warning. And um, we read from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8. We won't go through the entire chapter. And um, I just ask that you continue to read Deuteronomy chapter 8, but the entire chapter. And let the Lord minister to you, let the Lord show you um, errors of your heart and of your life. Because he wants to bless his people. And uh, this is not a prosperity message in the sense of finances and wealth and riches. The Bible has a lot to say about all of those things. But God wants things to be put in his perspective that he must be sought first. We must desire him. We must long for him. We must hunger for him. We must thirst for him. If, if that is not um, the emphasis of our walk with God and because of our circumstances and because of our needs that we have, that becomes the emphasis just getting our needs met. And so many Christians, this is what happened to so many Christians, that they have needs, we all have needs, financial needs, material needs. And so we see the, the word of God that is um, just covered with a lot of things to do with uh, God supplying, God blessing us. And, and it's so easy to get things back to front when you are consumed with a need. So what happens is that your prayers and your time with God is spent just getting your need, just petitioning God and petitioning God and petitioning God and telling God all what you need in your life. Now, our Father prayer is a pattern, a pattern for us how to pray. And part of that prayer is give us this day our daily bread. This is provision. But what happens with many Christians, that becomes the whole lifestyle in their walk with God. So what happens is that when the breakthrough now comes, and perhaps money is no longer an object in one's life, then you could easily be left in, in a state of, oh, not realizing that most of your life was taken up in just praying for needs, needs, and not, Lord, I want to know you more. And Paul prayed in the book of Ephesians, um, concerning the church, Ephesians 1 and, uh, and 15, that the God of our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, will grant unto you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, that you may know the hope of His calling. These are poignant, important for our spiritual development and growth. And Peter prayed, when well, Peter said that we should grow in the knowledge and the wisdom of God. If you're not growing in the things of God, what are you receiving? Do you, do you have a love for the Word of God? If you have no desire for the Bible, if you have no desire to know the Lord more, but you just consume with need, there is a season, there come seasons in our Christian walk where the Lord will have us to focus for a time on getting a breakthrough. We will sense the season is upon us, and just like a woman in travail, she had waited nine months, gone through all that discomfort of um, possibly turning, trying to find inside, it's best to sleep and whatever. And, um, and then it comes down, the water is now broken. It's time to deliver. All that time, now it's time to travail. The most, this, comforting son of the pregnancy uh, and, and, and strenuous and serious and it could, um, it could go the other way and not having the strength and you've got all these uh, stuff they can control take away the pain and, and, and stuff like that but still you have to push to get this baby out 
We've been trying to get this baby out for a long time. Thank God has for the church. Hallelujah. There's been all complication. Thank God for the big wife, the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. <laughs> the big wife is there to help the, uh, uh, the mother that is giving birth and, and say all the right things and everything. And just the, the big wife is like the coach. Come on, push. You know, and, and I've got no strength. And, 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 she, and the Holy Spirit is there. He's come alongside us. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is a paraclete. He comes alongside to help us, to give us the strength when we have no strength. Oh Lord, I don't know if I can pray anymore because I had my home dashed. I thought it was better. and I thought this was going to happen. This way you fall on the Lord. Lord, give me strength. That's the Spirit of God. That's one of His main purpose is to help you. That when your faith has been so deflated because of what you have gone through or been going through, you think, oh God, the harvest is there, but Lord, I haven't got the energy to push. And this is where the Spirit of God will come and quicken you and empower you and enable you to, to, uh, to, to continue to pray, but not just pray, because you can pray, but there's no faith. And faith without works is dead. Okay, so you're praying according to knowledge that Jesus Christ has paid the price, that he's the source of all blessings, all right, and that he has paid the price for you to be blessed. So with that knowledge, Lord, you want me blessed. The devil wants me cursed. But I thank you, Jesus, that you took my curse. Amen. That you took the curse. Amen. Hallelujah, of lack, of failure, of poverty, of all the other negative stuff. And we keep our faith there. Amen. We maintain our faith. We maintain our Amen. faith by declaring, by speaking to ourselves what Christ has done. And then we begin to declare those things, what Christ has done for me to be blessed. Amen. Satan, you therefore have no right. There is no legal right. I come against you with the blood because it was a blood that was the payment. Yeah. It was a blood of Jesus that was the payment for my victory. For me to overcome, for me to be more than a conqueror. It was the blood of Jesus that paid for my victory, for my deliverance, for my healing, for my breakthrough. Everything, the payment has been made. Now, all the Lord is looking for is your faith to be maintained in that. Don't move away from that. Yes, the enemy is attacking you this way, that way, that way, and even behind you. You're hearing words, but maintain your faith. Don't take your eyes off the cross of Calvary, of what Christ did for you, has done for you, and the breakthrough will come smashing through. Hallelujah. We're about to have this baby church. Hallelujah. And we've got to be one accord. We've got to be single-minded in the area of keeping focus because the devil is just doing what he has always been doing. Trying to steal, kill, and destroy. Okay, to distract you, to, to throw smoke screen, to get you to doubt God, to get you to complain, to get you in anger and bitterness. It just, it's a distraction. It's a dis, be careful. Be careful of distraction. You're on the right path. You're on the right road, church. And the devil knows it. He knows he's defeated, but he's fighting out of a position of defeat by lying to you and trying to get you to listen to his lies. Where is God? It's not going to happen. And we get down, and sometimes those things do get us down. The righteous shall fall, but he shall get up again, the Bible says. Amen. Shall fall seven times, but get up again. Amen. If you fall, get back up. Amen. Anybody watch boxing? Amen. You know, when the opponent gets knocked down? One, two, three. The devil's just counting, trying to count us out. Some Christians are out for the count. But thank God for mercy. Thank Amen. God for Jesus says I'm the resurrection of the life. Hallelujah. He can place his resurrection power in us and pick us off our canvas. He says, get up. I know you're down. I know you've been knocked down by what you've been hearing, by what's been happening. But get up, my son. Get up, my daughter. I have already paid the price. Hallelujah. Glory. You turn to the cross. You turn
turn to the cross. Not a wooden beam, but what Jesus did. Get up, you go in the power of his might. God said to Gideon, go. Go in the power of my might. And the Lord is saying, well, Lord, if you're with us, then why is this all happening? That's the normal human nature, isn't it? Gideon, that's the first thing. Like Gideon said to the angel that says, the Lord, the Lord is uh, with you, mighty man of God. Well, if he's with us, while all these things happen to us, notice God did not answer it. Go now. Go now. And so, um, and, 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 and well, we're still looking for the answers, isn't it? We're still looking for the answers, and, and, and in doing that, our minds are along uh, a path, and the, the enemy is just uh, knocking us uh, to and fro. Focus on what God uh, is saying. Amen. Hallelujah. God is with us, Tabernacle Christian Centre. Hallelujah. God is with you, those who are watching on television, regardless of your circumstances and, your, and the situation that you're in. God is with you. It looks like you're sleeping. Like that situation in the boat. Not that you cannot be perished. <laughs> uh, where is your faith? He's saved. So he's, he's ordering us, commanding us to stay in faith. To have faith. To have the faith of God. Amen. Amen. And um, as children were on uh, the, the verge of a major breakthrough. And there, there's so much in this um, chapter church that the Lord wants to warn us that we do not become like the children of Israel because even though they had this warning they still went astray so then what is the emphasis then if God ended up blessing the children of Israel by bringing them into a land that flowed with milk and honey because he did that according to the promise that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even though the children of Israel were rebellious and disobedient, but because of the covenant. And they heard, they all heard the word of God through the mouth of Moses, through the mouth of Joshua. And they ended up going astray. It's like, yes, Lord, thank you, that's wonderful. Yes, Lord, I will love you, I will serve you say that all in their strength and then two years down the line they've already turned away from God and money has now become their God materialism has now become their God and a few years down the road from that things just begin to falter and fail in their lives everything and they realize where their emphasis where their focus was it wasn't really on Jesus they were only following and you've got Christians in the same category they're following Jesus for the loaves and the fish because they heard what God can do oh he can make you wealthy right I'm in for that they're in church and they hear the wonderful prophecies wow God is going to do this I'm up for that what about your love for the Lord? Are you up for that? What about getting right with God? Are you up for that? What about holiness and righteousness? Are you up for that? Oh, don't talk about that. Oh, just tell me about the prosperity. Just tell me about the blessing. Yeah, the flesh loves all of that. And we need those things. But God knows we need those things. He gives those things for our enjoyment. But loving the Lord, church, is the most important thing in a Christian life. Jesus says you shall love the Lord your God with all your hearts, with all your mind, with all, with all your soul, and with all your strength. You shall love the Lord. And if you love the Lord, you're going to obey Him. If you love the Lord, you're going to listen to Him. If you love the Lord, you're not going to want to hurt Him. You don't just pay lip service and say, Lord, I love you. And yet you won't do his commandments. You won't obey him. You don't love the Lord. It's just words. It's just lip service. And this is the indictment against the children of Israel. 
Yes, Lord, we will do your, your commandments. Yes, Lord, we love you. Lip service. And you saw, as you read, on and on, the failure, the failure, the failure of the children of Israel. And they didn't have the Holy Spirit. We had the Holy Spirit. And yet the church is still failing in so many ways. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. We are left off. At verse number two, so let's just have a quick breeze through um, Deuteronomy chapter eight and verse number two, and you shall remember. David yeah, says in Psalms 103, verse one, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not. Why? Because as humans we forget. We forget, and as soon as we forget, we just go back. To what we have. All the old stuff comes flooding back into our lives. We become ungrateful, we become selfish, we become uh, religious, judgmental, all the old stuff. And David says, forget not all his benefit. Have you taken time to recount in the midst of your crisis, in the midst of all that you're going through, what the Lord has done for you? Count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord have done, has done. Why is it important to remember and to recount? So you remain grateful, not selfish, not self-centered, self-centered, me, myself, and I. I need, I need, I want, I want, I have to, I have to, I, 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 I. God wants us to get away from the I. God wants us to get away from self. Deny your self. Deny your self. And, and, and there are helps in the Bible, scriptures to help us. Remembering the Lord. Forget not all his benefits. It's, it's amazing that when you're going through the fire, when you're going through a trial, how, it, how you just forget. You forget all the good times. You forget what God has done for you. You forget how he's delivered you, how he's saved you, how he's made a way for you. All that just goes out the window and you're literally being bombarded by the present situation but you can't see a way out in the natural. And that is just dominating your mind. And so, to try and recall, you just focus on me, myself and I. You feel that you are the victim. The devil feels that you are a victim. And then you begin to feel sorry for yourself. And uh, Joshua was on the uh, oh, there now, and I've asked him to take out his violin and he began to pray, Oh me, oh my, oh me, oh my, oh I'm, it's always happening to me, oh there's nothing good, oh this is happening again. And you, 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 you go into self, what? Pity. It's a horrible place to be because everything is focused on you. You. There's no one going through what you are going through. That's what the devil says. No one understands. No one is going through what you're... Poor you. We, we, you've got to fight that, church. It, listen, thank you, Holy Spirit. It feels comforting to the flesh when you are focused on yourself. And no one is going through what you are going through. And yet, the Bible says in Matthew 5, it says, Blessed are you when men persecute you and revile you and say all manner of things against you falsely for my sake. It says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted the prophets which were before you. In other words, God says, there were others before you that went through the same stuff and even worse. So when the Bible says, you know, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. But others went through. Others, you are not the only one. Don't listen to that lie. If you do, you will never come out of that pit, that mire of self-pity 
And somehow we get there trying to think that God will feel sorry for us. Oh my God, thank you Lord. Listen, God is a respecter of a person's faith. Not need. Not need. There are needs everywhere and everywhere. If God was moved by your need, then all needs will be met. The Bible says without Hebrews 11, without what? Faith is what? Impossible to please God. The Lord is saying something here. Are, are you listening with your spiritual ears, church? Come out of self-pity. Don't entertain that. It doesn't bring breakthrough. You cannot twist the arm of God to get God to work for you and to meet your need. For God looks at faith. Faith triggers the power of God when your faith is stationed and parked in who Christ is Amen. and what he has done. You park your faith there daily, declaring and speaking what God has done for you. Godless of the battles and will come because uh, you're being tested to see if it's really real. My Lord, and you shall remember that, uh, that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness and that's the um, result that he intended through situation. Wilderness is a dry place, it's a barren place, nothing hardly grows in the wilderness and every Christian must go through, through. You mustn't live there, you mustn't stay there. David says, yea, but I walk through not make my camp, not make my dwelling, yea, while I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we and every one of us, we will go, God will take, this is a picture, this is a picture that God will take the church, why? Right? Because there's so much flesh in us. We don't realize how much flesh, and when I mention that word flesh, it's a, it's, it's a Bible word, it's a Christian jargon as well, um, it's so much of self in us. So much of pride and arrogance, we don't realize our selfishness, our arrogance, our uh, self-righteousness, how that comes up. You know, we see someone fall and all of a sudden we want to judge, all of a sudden we want to criticize. That, that's flesh. And, and, and God allows us to, uh, to go into the wilderness. And all these things, God begins to deal with us. The wilderness is like an operating theater. You are on that operating table. For God to take out stuff out of you. He wants you to see yourself, really what you are, when you think you're all wonderful and whatever. Then God begins to show you by bringing things, allowing things to come into your life, family members playing up and seeing what your response is. He allows that, the devil allows that he, he begins to stir our family against you. Okay, this is the wilderness, this is the dry place, and many compromise in that wilderness. Many do not let the light shine. In your place of work, things begin to go against you with the boss, with the supervisor, with the work colleague, whatever, um, the line manager, and uh, all of a sudden uh, people are talking about, and then what, what's coming out of you? What's coming out of you? God allows that to happen to see, so you can see what's in you. And, and if you're not dealing with those things the Bible way, the Bible way, guess what? You're going to stay in that wilderness. You're not coming out of that wilderness. Because you're going to be corrupted. When things begin to happen, uh, blessings begin to come in your life. Just like the children of Israel. We have this for our learning. Things weren't out of them. Egypt was still in them. Materialism, the love of money, was there in their lives. They did not know God's ways. We must make this uh, center of our prayer. Lord, teach me your ways. Lord, teach me your ways. Lord, teach me your ways. Teach me your ways, O oh Lord. I want to know your ways. 
in the midst of praying for your needs. Lord, I need to know you. I don't know you as I should know you. Lord, I don't love you as I should love you. That kind of a person, God is going to bless. He won't be overdone. Because God will cut away the flesh. He will be cutting away the stuff in our lives as we are broken before God. Been broken before God. So he did that to humble you and to test you. To know what was in your heart. This is the whole purpose for wilderness. Wilderness is the trials, the testing. The circumstances of life that comes your way. What's in you will come out. Squeeze you, put a bit of pressure. What comes out of you? What comes out of, what comes out of the mouth? When someone is lying against you, when someone has betrayed you, what comes out of you? God wants to see. God wants. He said, "He God knows what's in your heart, but you know something? We don't know what's in our hearts. We really don't know." Push comes to shove. When push comes to shove, then you know we we frighten what comes out of us. And before we repent and go before God, it says, Oh God, Lord, help me, cleanse me, purge me, create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit. We get in pride and we go into denial and we get self-righteous and we justify ourselves in our mannerism and in our behavior and our response and our attitude towards something that has happened. We justify ourselves. Pride is taking root in our hearts and in our lives. I mean, God is looking for you to, to humble yourself, to repent, pride, I'm right, I'm going to have the last word, you know, and we just hug, and God can only use it to a certain extent. But he looks for the heart, he looks for the heart that is broken, he looks for the heart that is repentant. And he says, oh, I'm not going to raise this one up, because this one will honor me, this person is going to honor me. There will be no limits to what I will do for such a person. Because they're not self-seeking. They're looking always to glorify God. Whether you will keep his commandments or not. If you have failed by not keeping his commandments, by not obeying his word, by not doing what he has asked you to do, repent, church. Don't pretend. Lord, I have not been faithful in obedience. Because I've been going through stuff in my life, I gave myself the permission and the right to feel the way how I felt and to behave the way how I felt. Resist that. Run away from that. That is not good. The flesh does that. The flesh takes consolation in that. And the devil is the one who gets the glory, not Jesus. Jesus gets the glory when one humbles themselves. Come off your high horse and says, Lord, I have wronged. I have wronged. I have not been obedient. I have not kept your commandments whilst going through the valley. And every one of us will fall at times. But you see, it's when we fall and when we fail, when we disobey, we must remember, Lord, I am sorry. Sorry for my arrogance. Sorry for my disobedience. Sorry for my pride. Sorry when that time came, Lord God, and I didn't humble myself. And I just want to, you know, self just came. Lord, I'm sorry. Please help me to be conformed to the image of your Son, Lord. Please help me, Father, to be more like Jesus. So, Father, please pour into my life the spirit of revelation and knowledge of Christ. For I want to be more like Christ. I want to behave more like Him. I want to act more like Him. I want to love like Him. I want to forgive like Him. Anybody here? This is, this is how God is glorified. This is what excites the Holy Spirit. Then to begin to work in your life. Because he sees that your life is just filled with wanting to please the Lord. Wanting to give 
in the glory. And the Holy Spirit, remember when he comes, Jesus, he will testify of me. He will bear witness of me. He will glorify me. So if, we, if the Holy Spirit sees us wanting to glorify God, wanting to be more like Christ, then the Holy Spirit is going to help us. There's going to be enormous latitude given for the Holy Spirit to have liberty in your life. But when there's arrogance and pride and, and stubborn will and, and selfishness and, and self-righteousness, the Holy Spirit is very limited. The indictment of the church is that self is so much alive. Very few focus on the fruit. According to Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, meekness, gentleness, kindness. How many people with those attributes operating in their lives? I see very little in the church. And the emphasis is everything else, the power, this and that. And yes, there must be a balance. The power in there, the gifts of the Holy Spirit we're praying for, miracles and signs and wonders and prosperity so we can do more for God. But what about the fruit? And this is what you saw in, in, in these men of God, in, in the scriptures, why God raised them up. The Bible says, the Bible says, there was no one like Moses. As humble as Moses. It's like Christ. But he wasn't like that at the beginning. He wasn't like that at the beginning. It's what he went through. Joseph was not what he was at the beginning. It's what the Lord allowed him to go through. To bring out all the junk that's in his heart. You must understand, church, and we must understand that the wilderness is there to test what's in you. Why haven't you been consistent? Why have you stopped praying? Because of the trials? Yes, there's a day because of situation you may miss. But when you begin to live like that, because you are angry with your God, and you're going to strike, I'm not going to read it anymore. People that need to get God's attention. Oh, faith gets his attention. Faith gets his attention. Faith, nothing else but faith. That's the currency that operates in the heavenly realm. Faith, hallelujah, nothing else. Not your sympathy, not your pity. It's faith. Oh my Lord, the Lord is saying something here. God is speaking to us, church. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying. And, and, and where you need to be corrected, humble yourself. The Holy Spirit is saying, but many have not kept my commandments. Many have not obeyed me whilst going through. And, and, and oh Lord, you have so. And so what happens? You're in your life. Not gonna admit you're in denial. It's pride. That's called pride. Pride. When you're in denial and you do not want to own up, you do not want to admit. Why do you think God is going to cover you? Because you admit that you've done something wrong. They do that in the world, don't they? You say you're sorry and they, they make sport capital of that. And I don't know if it's in our psyche that I, I, I won't admit that I have fallen, I won't admit that I have failed, I've not been consistent because God may not bless me. It's not in the Bible, church. It's not in the Bible. Again, what do we have in the Bible? Many examples. David <laughs> admitted he's wrong. Did God withdraw his blessings from David? Did God curse David? Because he humbled himself, Nathan said. Nathan the prophet that addressed David concerning his sin. Because you have humbled yourself, you've got to look at that and take the tip from that. David, God is not going to kill you. Your crime, David, King David, deserved death. Even you said it yourself. But God will not kill you. 
because he has seen that you humbled yourself. God is saying, humble yourself. That's what the wilderness is there for. Admit. Admit your faults. Admit your shortcomings. And, and God will bless you. God is not going to reject you. He's not going to turn his back on you. He draws near to the humble. But he resists the pride. Those who are proud. The Bible says he resists the proud. But he draws near to the humble. Why have we got a back to front? Why do you think if we humble ourselves, God is not going to bless us? Somebody said the devil is alive. Absolutely, he is 100% a liar. He would have us to think because when we admit our faults, that's why we don't want to say sorry to one another. When we, when we fail, when we do something wrong, because we think they would have the upper hand over us. We think they would have the advantage over us. We think they would take that and manipulate us and use that against us. Not so with our maker. He's a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of restoration, a God of faithfulness, a God of loving kindness. And he, he looks for humility. He looks for us to admit. And that's how we draw near to David. And we know his crime was atrocious. It was terrible. But David Unforgivable, unforgivable in the natural world. People would have never forgiven. If a David like today happened, good Lord, you'll stone him. He'll never be welcome into the church. Look what God did. Because Nathan said, Please the Holy Spirit, because he needs to I'm being repetitive. For a reason, because he humbled himself. Because he humbled himself. Thank you, Jesus. It, it's, it's the word of God is never exhausted. It, 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 there's just so much. But when you read the word of God, read so God can speak to you. Read so God can show you. Not to you to you say, oh, I've got a revelation. I've got this. So I can tell you about it. But what about you? Well, what does it say to you? How have you applied that revelation to your life? How have you, adjust, have you adjusted to that revelation? Or you just want revelation so you can just say, oh, listen to this, and, and look how wonderful I am. Get away from that pride. That, that's, that, that's a stench in the nostrils of our God because it reminds God of Satan. And he was lifted up in pride. Don't be like Consistent, steadfast, consistent, steadfast, and you feel power of this thing. Oh, oh, you have to resist that, resist that, because that's the wisdom. That's what he did, that's why he did it high trees. Against his maker, and his maker kicked him out. And then we all one third decided to do it. Don't allow God to take his hands in because of the fire. And so I said yet last week, everything for the believer most of all is a test of our response. And many times I come before God's and God's people for responding in the wrong way. I responded in the wrong way. My attitude. Forgive me of my wrong attitude. Everything at that moment, church, I said, when you're going to the fire, you're going to everything. Try and justify it. Because, like, I should not be going for this. Why? Because you look at all the good that you have done. So, somehow, do you feel that you are worthy of whatever should come to you? And so, because the opposite has happened to you, then your behavior and your response is the wrong way. Don't entertain it. Quickly admit. And, and, and can refute that and uh, resist that. Verse number three. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger. 
Virgin Ivana, which he did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might hate him. He know that man shall not live by bread alone. Hmm. But man lives by every word of God, or by every word of the word of God that proceeds from the mouth of God. Food is everything. Real life comes by obeying every word of God. Real life, true life, comes by obeying the word of God. God's commandment. Not helping to obey you more. Because true life and real life is in obeying you. They that are willing and obedient shall eat what the fat, the good of the land. Obedience. That's where true life is wrapped up in church, is obeying God. So that our prayers, Lord, help me to obey you. And we know that many times we don't want to obey God. The flesh war against that. The flesh, there's a war. I don't want to. stubbornness comes in. Our heels are dug in. And somehow, I don't know what we think at that moment. But God takes his hands off. Because God will not put up with a stubborn and a stiff neck. And we can see that in the scriptures. And Paul reiterates the more than his experience in the book of Hebrews. So when people, you know, that's Old Testament, pastor, you know, you're onto legalism. We're under grace. But Paul reiterates the experience of the children of Israel in the wilderness. And he tells us and warns us, be careful. New Testament. So you get these people that, you know, they're under grace now. That's Old Testament. Gone into error. Right? Using grace, uh, hyper grace, hyper nonsense. Then let's look at verse 5, shall we? Says, you should know in your heart that as a man chastens, chasten is discipline, corrects. So as a man, parents correct their children corrects their children. And so this is all in the wilderness. This is all in the wilderness. So the Lord, your God, chastens you. And we know that same verse is also in the New Testament, right? It's in, it's in Newton, book of Hebrews. Okay? So, um, so, so, what's happening here? Again, the wilderness brings up issues in us and the Lord begins to correct us and discipline us. Because in the wilderness, we become disobedient at times. Hello, am I speaking to anybody? In the wilderness, when things are going wrong, we become disobedient. We want to have our own way. We become stubborn. We throw tantrums. And so, God loves us so much because He knows that if He leaves us and notice the example is using as a, a parent and the child. If you leave the child, what happens to that child? Becomes spoiled. Becomes brutish. In the book of Hebrews, uh, the proverb uh, says that an undisciplined person becomes brutish. Inhuman. Another translation brings that up. Inhuman. When you do not chastise, correct, Discipline, you leave the child to their own devices because they're throwing a tantrum. If God was to leave us, we will likewise perish. We will perish. We will lose our way. God knows that. Listen, no one knows the human nature like God does. It's fallen, it's deprived. 
God knows our human nature and he knows how to get things out of us that is there that is causing shortcomings in our lives. And so, that's why he says here in verse 5, as a person chases his son, so the Lord, your God, chastens you because, and, and Paul elaborates more on that, the Lord loves those because of his love. And again, a, a parent corrects their children because they love their children, right? They love their children. You correct your child because you love, although no child likes discipline. None of us likes discipline. Hooray! Hooray! More oh Lord! No, we don't like it. And it doesn't seem good for that moment, as the Bible says. But it produces wonderful fruit, character in the life of that child. Oh, what a well-behaved child. By the way, was he or she born that way? <laughs> what did you do? They don't want to hear about the correction, the strictness. Oh, that's, that's horrible. In this 21st century, child abuse. Child abuse. Not allowing the child to do what it wants to do. It's only expressing, they're only expressing themselves. Foolish people. Absolutely foolish. Don't let me go there. <laughs> and, and, and so the Lord, the Lord chasing those. And as, as I said, no one wants to listen at times. We don't like to listen. We don't like to be corrected. We don't like to admit that we are wrong. And this is a fall in the brain human nature. You must understand that, that the flesh doesn't like to admit. Derek, you're wrong. As I like to speak to myself, you're wrong. You are wrong. We don't like that. But you must embrace that for God to begin to lift you up and for God to add more into your life and for God himself because you have been molded and you have been shaped to become, thank you Lord, a vessel of honor in the house of the Lord. If it doesn't chase you, you become a vessel of dishonor. Dishonor! God doesn't want that. So understand what's happening in the wilderness and when he disciplines you even and he uses people. So God was seeking to correct the children of Israel wayward attitudes. In the wilderness, they had wayward Attitude, just like we have waywardness in us, as in, as in the human nature that is fallen. And so God, through circumstances, bring correction. And we push God away many times. Oh Lord, we're so foolish. Forgive us, Lord. We think we know more than you. So we would ask you so that he might be prepared. He's preparing you, thank you Lord, for obedience. To walk in obedience. Look at the patriarchs, look at the patriarchs. Get your mind, if you know the patriarchs, what is one of the major attributes you do you see in their lives? Obedience. And even those who weren't obedient at times like Jonah was really mad, took it off in the opposite direction because of the people there were nice uh, to the people of Israel. So he didn't want to obey God, he didn't want the people to repent, he just wanted to see God's vengeance and judgment. So he became, he was a disobedient, but through this, oh, that's a, thank you Lord for that picture. How did God chastise Jonah? Sent a fish, didn't he? Sometimes God will send a fish our way. A spiritual situation that will back us against the wall and there is no more running. 
God will sometimes do that to get your attention. He allows everything around you to collapse. Nothing to work. To get your attention because he loves you. He doesn't hate you. The devil says he's a killjoy. He doesn't want you to have a good time. He doesn't want you to be happy. Devil, you're a liar. You are a liar. God wants the best for me. He wants the best, but he wants to protect me. He wants me to be aware of my fallen human nature, what it contains. And that's why he's allowing these things in my life. That's how he wants you to see things. But when you're self-centered and focus on yourself, you're not going to see it. You're just going to see yourself, 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 yourself. I, 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 me, 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 me. And the bigger picture is lost of what God wants to do in your life. He wants to show you. That's why you've got to take your eyes off you. Take your eyes off yourself. Lord, let me see what is happening here. What are you doing? What are you saying to me? The children of Israel did not discern that. They did not perceive that. The Lord had to tell them. But um, they lost their way. Look at verse 9. 9. Okay, let's go to verse um, 8. Okay, so, so all of this, from verse well, from 10 to 19, really, um, it's, it's the blessing. It speaks of the blessing of God. Uh, the, the land with wheat, barley, vines, which is grapes, fig trees, pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. Listen, just stop there. These are the best foods. People overlook that. This is the list of God's choices, blessings. So none of these things here are unhealthy. None of these things are rubbish. God has given a list, okay, of what Canaan has. It has the best of the best of the best of the best. So there's a health and nutrition thing here for us to understand. This is how the Lord talked me about health and nutrition. He showed me these things. He said, would I give my people rubbish? When I'm talking about the, the, the Canaan, what is Canaan land? And no, Canaan land is a, it is a symbol for heaven as well. It's, it, it's, it's mentioned in song, Canaan land. And so it's all the good things. And so understand that wheat and barley, wheat and barley has all the vitamins, do I go into that? All the vitamins and minerals, amino acids and proteins that your body needs. See, people just get so spiritual, they want to hear the spiritual stuff. But there's a spiritual blessing here, and there is a physical blessing here. When we treat and put the right fuel in our bodies, high octane fuel this is, and so you're going to get a good performance. Lamborghini needs high octane fuel, right? To get the best out of their vehicle. If it puts a low grade, it's not. Stop putting low grade foods in your body and complaining. Oh, I'm tired. You're putting in low. Uh, shall I go there? Oh, okay. And crates and figs and the big tree, pomegranate, brilliant for the heart. Anyway, <laughs> a land of olive oil. Antimicrobial, antibiotic, in that oil, oh, the real stuff, honey, again, antiseptic, lovely. You want to be in good health? God gives us clues in His Word. Gives us His code, it's filled with so much. But many times we just have a narrow way of seeing things. Amen. So God wants us healthy. You see, you can end up with wealth and no health to enjoy the wealth. Or use your wealth to buy rubbish and put it in your body. Oh, and we're going to bless it and sanctify it with the word of God. <laughs> and yet you end up with food poisoning, you end up sick, you end up with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and all that kind of stuff. And you think, what's happening? What well, I bless my food? We mustn't be ignorant. God doesn't want us to be ignorant of his word. Uh, okay, I'm going to have to teach on that another time. But the Lord taught me health from the scriptures. 
Anyway, you can, you can just look up all those foods and see what vitamins and minerals are there and proteins and amino acids that our body needs. And you see these things are full with those things. So, um, so let, let's go on to verse 9, shall we? A land in which you will eat bread. The right bread is correct. It's in the Bible. So when the Lord was saying all this, I hear all this Atkins and diet and stuff like that, and I says, and they said, and they said, well, we're not going to eat bread. I said, God says, don't listen to that. It's in the Bible. It's the wrong bread we're eating, though. The Ezekiel bread is a proper bell. Anyway, um, <laughs> and it says, a land in which you would eat bread without scarcity. So. What, what, what is God trying to project for himself here and allow us to see? He wants us to see that he is a good God. He wants us to see that he wants to bless us to overflowing. And, and this is what he did for them. He blessed these disobedient people with overflowing blessings. They eventually entered the promised land, the, the children. But didn't learn, unfortunately. They didn't have the Holy Spirit within them, remember? We have. So, without scarcity, so God, you want to bless me with more than enough so that I can have more to give away. Yeah. I've been saying uh, to the Lord for many, many years, Lord, uh, you talk about the time being 10%, give 10%, this is the obedience, give 10% of your increase. I said, Lord, I want to get to a place where I am living off 10% and giving you 90%. Yes. Amen. You can never outgive God. Can we talk about money here? So much. Without scarcity, without scarcity, in other words, without lack, without want. David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In other words, I shall not lack for anything. This is material. The Bible says that money answers all things. Materially, not spiritually. That's why you can have money, but no happiness. Money, but no joy. Money, but no peace. And I don't know if you've seen some of these shows of people who won the lottery. And what happened since the one good number of them when the lot won the lottery? They said the life has been miserable. Some of them won them actually admit that I he said, I wish we didn't uh, have won so much money. Since all this has happened, family splits because family comes out of the woodwork and they think they should have half or part of that, and they get greedy and stuff like that. And why do you want to have so much and fights and inward fighting takes place? We must understand that money. There's a purpose for it. When we don't understand the purpose of money, we're going to abuse it. When you don't understand the purpose for money, you will abuse it. And our purpose is different from the purpose of the world. God gives his children, as we read in Deuteronomy 8, power to get wealth, to establish his work. His work cannot progress. You cannot accomplish any vision of God without money. Think about it. If God calls you to be a pastor, you're going to be in a church. You get in the church, you're going to need to keep the church. What does it take to keep the church? See, so people say, oh, just pray, just pray, just pray. Come, let's get serious. Okay, there's bills, right? So, so you, you will see that the vision takes finances. If God is calling you to a developing country of the world, a poor country of the world, to do a missionary work, you've got to get a plane ticket. You can't get there by prayer alone. Prayer can break through things to get people's hearts to be touched, to say, oh, God has spoke to me to give you this. Boom. Prayer does that. Understand? But prayer itself won't get you to that country. You need to buy a ticket cost money money you understand and so when you get there and, and you see the poverty you want to help the people but you haven't got the money you just don't want to preach to them exactly what we did when we went to Liberia 
We didn't just preach to the people and saw healings and saw great things happen, but we got money transferred to help buy this. And we came back the following year with Bibles, over uh, we bought 120 study Bibles. It didn't fall out the sky. We asked the church. We bought the Bibles. We found out else what they need because the uh, Many men were starving. They were only having one meal a day. I thought, no. What is your diet? Corn, this and that. So we got the seeds from here. We saw the, uh, the chief in the village. They welcomed us. They were happy. We gave them the stuff. They shared it out amongst the village. With the excess, take it to market. And sell it. And get an income for your family. Practical Christianity. Making a change because of money. Without that, we can impact the people. Our names went right across Liberia. A British missionary come over to help us. It took money, church. Without scarcity. So you can be a blessing. Be a blessing. Don't just be mean. Don't be mean. Oh Lord, I want to look at the scripture church before we close. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. And verse number five. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In the wilderness, it should teach you contentment. Some people never come to that place because they continue to live above their means. Live to impress. When the Bible says, let your conduct be without covetous. Oh, look what they're driving. Oh, look what they're wearing. I've got to get myself. I've got to keep up with the Joneses. Never learn to be content. You've never learned. People have never learned to be contented. Go without Every year before we went through the wilderness, I would visit the cells, Christmas cells, summer cells. And buy those expensive garments that were reduced to nothing. When the wilderness came, and that couldn't happen anymore, I still was going to the shop window just to look. <laughs> I was going through withdrawal symptoms. It was painful. Wow, 70% reduction. Oh my gosh. Oh, yes. I was going down to Oxford Street, New Bond Street, Burberry, and all those places. And oh, I, it was, I was literally being torn to pieces. God was stripping me. Learn to be content. Learn. But I need no you don't need it you just want it <laughs> oh all this thing the law was taking us through good lord stripping us stripping us testing to see what our hearts why am i serving god is it for what i can get out of god oh thank you lord is it because of that wonderful prophecy that came into my life that god is going to do that oh that's why i'm serving god because what happened Prolong it. Prolong. Prolong. Then what comes out of you? Bitterness. Giving all of this. I've done all of this for God. And look. Look at my circumstances. All this stuff begins to come out in the wilderness. And some people turn their back on God. Because they were following Jesus for the loaves and the fish. And not because they love God.
because of what he did. He took away my sins. And you placed my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Jesus, you went through all that suffering. What love is this? I'm, I will be for eternally grateful for what you have done for me. I did not deserve this. That's why you love him. That's why you serve him. That's why you trust him. Because of when this is no longer the focus, when the devil successfully, subtly, cunningly managed to turn your eyes away from Calvary, you will go to the works of the flesh. You will start chase things. You will never be contented because you think, I deserve it. I deserve it. I deserve it. Never get to that place of contentment. Lord, I thank you. So that then he can then bless you. You get to that place of contentment so that he can then bless you. He said, I can now trust you with greater wealth and riches. Because I have seen what's in your heart. And I can now elevate you. Because I know that you are going to advance my kingdom. And you are not going to take it for yourself. And glorify yourself. And say, I, I, I have done this. But he would always be recognized. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, look at that. Time is flying. We, we, we're going to stay on this subject for quite some time. There is just so much areas. But the Lord, because he says, prepare my people. Prepare them. Amen. I will show them their hearts in this message. Amen. Where they're really at. If they really love me or they love money more than me. Let's bow our heads, shall we?